a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Jeremy Lee in the building and every guest that you ever needed. Sports cards after hours keep the hobby heated. Updates, hobby talk like you never seen it. Sports cards live and nothing could ever beat it. Sports cards is a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Welcome to another episode of Sports Cards Live with your host, Jeremy Lee. All right, everybody, welcome back. What has been going on the last two weeks in the hobby? I've been absent. I am back and I am happy to be here. Welcome, everybody. Episode number 219 of Sports Cards Live this Saturday night, March the 9th, 2024. My name is Jeremy Lee and again, happy to be back after a vacation. I do want to thank everybody who joined us last time. Our guest was Tom Ferrara, Pancake Analytics. You can see that episode on the YouTube channel. And next Saturday, our guest is Chris Torres. He's at CRT underscore sports cards on X. Very passionate vintage collector. So much so that he had his whole sleeve of his arm tattooed up with his T206 cards. He'll be our guest next. Next Saturday, PWCC Weekly Hockey Show comes back tomorrow night as well. Want to thank all of our sponsors and partners. A couple of shout outs right now. I'd like to ask you to join over half a million people who have downloaded the Center Stage app across both iOS and Android for quick and accurate comps and card identification. The Center Stage Marketplace, featuring super easy listing and reasonable transparent fees, is coming soon. Please join me in supporting the great team they have and the innovation they are undertaking. And let's help make Center Stage a great place to buy and sell singles. Also, use protection, practice safe. Swaps. Veriswap is an app and middleman service that lets you securely trade cards through the mail. Every transaction up to $1 million in value is fully insured by their guarantee. Check them out on iOS and Android. Join me and Veriswap founder Raymond Lee every second Tuesday on Instagram Live, where we go over three trades that occurred on the platform. And we ask you, the chat, what side you would prefer. Also, Filth Bomb Breaks offers live case breaks and box breaks, and they do so with responsibility and integrity. If you enjoy, group breaks and are looking for a company to break with check out filth bomb they are streaming over four channels on fanatics live seven days a week i want to shout out hobby news daily check them out for your daily dose of hobby information it's a great collaboration of many hobby content creators and of course Leighton sheldon and just collect will be joining us later tonight or shortly actually for the vintage spotlight segment as always i want to thank all loyal viewers and listeners for joining us and tuning in. If you're not yet subscribed to the Sports Cards Live YouTube channel or the podcast, please take a moment and do so. I see the comments rolling. We have a popular guest tonight. Let's get to it. As always, tonight, your comments and your questions are in play. All right, tonight's guest. He started in the hobby, opening packs of Topps baseball and football cards in the late 60s at the corner drugstore when he'd buy a pack or two every day after school with whatever change he had. He's collected complete sets pack by pack ever since, and he started his YouTube channel, A Collector's Dream, in January 2022. His favorite players of all time are Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle, King Kelly, and Minnie Minoso, and his favorite teams of all time are the New York Yankees and the Baltimore Orioles. He's originally from Havana, Cuba, currently hailing out of South Florida. Let's bring him out. Orlando. Welcome to Sports Cards Live, and how are you doing tonight, my new friend? I'm doing awesome, Jeremy, and I really appreciate you having me on on episode 219. This is a great episode. I'm usually in the chat, so I really uh, love that you're having me on live. It's just a pleasure, and thank you so much. Oh, well, hey, thank you for, for making the time and for uh, working with me on short notice. I did just get home from vacation late last night, so we didn't even really get to plan much until today, but uh, I'm grateful for the time we spent. And uh, as I said to you earlier, you know, one of the best things about doing what I do here, as far as my channel and content goes is, you know, the episodes are great, you know, up to two hours long, but I also spend time with the guests earlier. And that's, uh, those are the seedlings of, of friendships and relationships. And that's one of the, as we talked about Orlando, one of the best things about the hobby. We've got a great crowd in here. We are also streaming live to Instagram. So welcome everybody on Instagram tonight. And Orlando, let's uh, let's say hi to the chat. We got a lot. We got a lot of people. A lot of people are shouting you out. B Cox is here. Andrew Deutsch. Good evening. Andrew. Says subscribe to Orlando. A collector's dream is his channel, and he reminds us tonight is daylight savings. Remember that vintage goats. Welcome to the program, Justin Bode. Thank you so much. 
Mangini Collection is here. What's going on? Welcome to the show. Hitman, yo to you. Chris C says Orlando is a legend. 86 Collectibles is here. Thank you so much. Philly Joe just says, just watch on TV the Savannah Bananas from the Minute Maid Park. A lot of fun. Great. Ziggy Noah is here. What's going on? Jake Dahl. Dan's Vintage. Thank you so much. Baseball card curmudgeon. Return to collecting. I like that name right there. Dan says, amazing you have Orlando among the YouTube collectors. He's the beloved figure and such a nice man. Oh, and his collection is amazing. A lot of shout outs for you, Orlando. Robert Scott, what's going on? Welcome to Cardboard Corner. Chris C., we're not talking about Bedard tonight, Chris. Vintage says, oh, just trying to find decent deals. Good. Jeff McMahon, thank you. Thank you. Irish Flyers is here. Chris C. needs a 63 Kofax. The Mangini, let's get the card party started. Vintage. All right, guys, we got a lot of you in here. Mookie Chilson is here. Welcome. Says, Orlando is the mayor of Hobby Town, and he has a hockey. I know. I noticed earlier today his Florida Panthers sweater, all autographed in the background. I got to say, uh, Orlando, that did make me feel right at home here having you on. I can't even get through all these comments, you guys. But welcome. Amish Dave Archer is here. Mike Petty is here. Bobby Burrell, David G., Everyone's here. All right, guys, let's get into it. And thank you for joining us. Welcome, Orlando. Let's jump into it. You know, I like to start by talking often with guests about their hobby history. Now, you know, your hobby history, you've been talking about it on your channel for a couple of years now. So let's take a bit of a different uh, route here. And I want to talk a bit about the story you told me earlier. Tell the story you told me earlier, just about, you know, when you were young, going to spring training and some of the stories you saw, and how was your grandfather involved in getting you into the hobby? Well, my family's from Cuba, and in Cuba, baseball is definitely the dominant sport. Uh, you know, in other countries, it may be soccer, but not in Cuba. It, it was really uh, in Cuba, it started, uh, baseball started in the 1860s, and people don't realize that. And the, the first uh, league was established in the late 1800s. And basically, my family has always been in baseball, always loved baseball. My grandfather owned a, uh, a bodega, a grocery store there, and two grocery stores. And he sponsored a local team. And on that local team was a player. His name was Orlando Pena. And uh, we had to leave because of the communist situation there. And, and we left in 1960. And when we came to this country, my grandfather would take me to spring training because the Orioles played right there in, in Miami Stadium, which was maybe about two, three miles from where I lived. So one day we went to a game, he got a foul ball, and you know, I was a little kid, I probably, I don't know, 11, 12 years old, and he got the foul ball and he says, look, I know that player over there, his name's Orlando Pena, just like you. So I said, oh yeah, great, you know, and I was, I was just thrilled to be there. So in those days, you can just go in spring training, go right down, almost to the field, and we're right there. My grandfather calls him out. He comes there, and he recognizes him right away. He gives him a hug, and he takes the ball, and he says, come on, guides us all the way into the clubhouse. You know, it was after the game, into the dugout area. And in the dugout, I see all of these guys that I'm watching, you know, only on Saturday afternoon uh, games, you know, because in those days, they only had really three channels, and you didn't get to see baseball much. So Brooks Robinson, Jim Palmer, um, you know, Frank Robinson, um, Al Bunbury, Boog Powell, all those guys were there hanging out there and, 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 and gives them the ball to Jim Palmer and he gives it to all the other players there and they start signing and Brooks Robinson comes up to me, you know, and I, cause I'm sitting there, he's sitting at the end of the bench watching that my ball, everybody's signing it for me. And Brooks Robinson comes up and starts talking to me and asking me, you know, you love baseball? Do you play? And this and that. It just, God, it must have seemed like it was 15 minutes. It probably only was five minutes, but it seemed like such a long time. And it was just one of those impressions that it just stuck with me. You know, I played Little League at the time and uh, really was just getting into collecting cards. But that just gave me that big boost that I needed. And I still have that ball. You know, it's scuffed up. Some of the signatures are a little light. I've shown it on my channel. Um, I did a video on how I started collecting and I showed that ball and tell the story. And uh, it's just a priceless piece of my collection, you know, and, and I treasure that 
you know, forever. And those are the memories that I enjoy. And those are the things that uh, the, the card hobby and baseball card bring me are memories. And, and that's why I collect. I, I love how you mentioned that the ball, you still have the ball. It's scuffed up. The autographs are maybe fading a little bit. And to me, that's the best, like that just tells me that the ball has been loved and it's been appreciated and it hasn't just sat in a drawer, or even in a case, you know, just uh, the, for its whole existence. I, I think that's really cool. I, as I was telling you, you know, I, I used to have a jersey hanging behind me in my old spot and it was a game worn jersey. I used to wear it to all the card shows I'd go to because as I say, kind of tongue in cheek, I, I, I'm not going to pay a thousand dollars for a shirt and not wear it. So I, you know, I may as well wear it. Why have a ball if you're not going to play with it? Of course, I understand when it comes to some autographs, we're not going to do that. But I think that's that's a great story. And then, you know, this event for you at the ball game that day with Brooks Robinson, you know, it's memories like that. I, I think that's the 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 seedling of a of, of what can create a true collector is when you have you know, an experience like that, that really brings you into the game, brings you closer to the players that you might've been watching on TV or in the stands as a kid. And now you want to remain close to them. And cards have been sort of providing that or acting as that bridge for us over so many years. Do you, what is your opinion on, you know, and I titled this episode, a true collector's perspective. And one person even wrote to me and said, what's a true collector? I just said, Great question. You know, I didn't title it that to get into that or to, to start any controversy about what's a true collector or not, but it's it's still a fun discussion. I wonder, do you think though that by having an experience like you had as a youngster, that that pushed you along, you know, that path of becoming what how, what we would call a true collector? Yes, of course. I mean, there's certain things that really are memorable in your life. And, and, and things like that are something that, you know, just inspire you to, um, you know, essentially, you know, I wanted to be a ball player, of course, like, like them, you know. And, um, you know, I got involved in that. And since I played the Little League, I was able to connect with a lot of similar kids like me. And they collected cards. And that just got us collecting cards. And, you know, at, what, what playing sports does is, you know, it makes you competitive. So, you know, you, you want to, you, they got cards, you want to go some, get some more cards. And when you're a young kid like that, you know, you want to do that, you know. And eventually you kind of, you know, go your own way. And, and that's what happened to me after, after I just kind of, uh, you know, when you got into college, you kind of left that. But to me, it inspired me just to, to collect cards. And then what I started doing was, you know, I, I would like go and, and pick up packs at the corner drugstore right after school with whatever money I had, whatever change I had left from, from lunch money. And then uh, when I could, I would go mow lawns. I would wash cars. I mean, in those days, you know, packs were, you know, 10 cents a, a pack. So, you know, I would go buy a whole box of 1970 Topps cards and open them all up. And, and I had two sisters. They loved the gum. They would just I'd pile a whole pile of gum and they stuff them in their face. And I remember my mother, you know, hey, don't, you know, don't chew all those gum only one at a time. And then she'd take the whole stack of gum that I had because I'd open the whole box. So I built sets, you know, I built the 1970, 71, 72, 70, all the 70 sets straight from opening packs. And, and that kind of inspired the collector in me. And, you know, a lot of collectors like, like me, I'm, I, I'm pretty, I'm a shy guy. I'm kind of introvert, you know, that's why I, on my channel, I don't show my face. My channel's about the cards and about the history of the cards and that type of stuff. And I, I never really intended to even show my face when I started it, you know, but going back to the, the, the collecting part, because I was shy, you know, I collected by myself and, you know, after, after a while and, and you kind of, you know, it, it's a place that takes you away from, from reality. And, you know, you don't, you know, you forget about all the problems in the world. We talked about this earlier. And, um, you know, that was one of the places for me that I felt the most comfortable was being alone with my collection, with my cards. It was just such a relaxing experience, sorting cards, putting them in order, you know, looking at the players, reading the backs, learning about these guys. You know, every one of these players, you know, we are collecting pictures of men on cards, you know, 
But every one of those players have a history. You know, they fought their way to get to the major leagues. You know, they, they, there's something they did to be on a card. And, you know, that's why it took me back to history. And when I saw some of these old, old players, old cards like that, even from the 1900s and 1800s, I would pick something up at the card shop or as a dealer since I was a part-time dealer. And I would just read up on the player. You know, in those days, you picked up a T206 and, you, you know, there was no eBay. So you didn't know that much about it other than the Beckett book. So you would read up on the player, who is this guy? And, and, and that got kind of really got me into the history of cards and players and so on. And just, uh, I love it. It keep, keeps me young. Yeah, no, for sure. You know, it's interesting the way we collect because, you know, a lot of us collect based on our, our childhood experiences and the, the, the players on the teams that we followed or a player that you had a personal in encounter with. And I think we, we find that these players somewhat represent us, especially if they play for our, our city or our, our, our team. Nowadays, though, I think we still see that a lot, but nowadays a lot of hobbyists, and I use the word hobbyists deliberately instead of collectors, but I think it, I could use either one. Um, a lot of hobbyists and collectors don't necessarily start with their favorite team. I, I don't collect anybody on my, I don't collect cards of my favorite team, but that's because I've learned that players don't stick around anymore. In the, in the 2000s, your players are on your team for a very short amount of time and then they're gone. So, and then you're heartbroken. So it's easier to collect players who have, uh, have had their careers behind them. But that, that's one of the connections that I, I, that, that I find. You're basically me about 10 or 15 years ahead. I was buying, set, buying packs and building sets pack by pack all throughout the 80s. And, I, and you were doing it in the, the late 60s and 70s. So I think when you start out with that and you talked about the, the packs and the gum, I, I, still, I still crave that gum. I love that gum. You know, when Tops Heritage came out 20-something years ago, you could still get the gum that tasted the same. So um, interesting stuff. Uh, really, really fun to talk about that. We've got a lot of comments coming, and I've got a few selected here, Orlando. So let's address some of those. And when we're done with that, I want to hear about the show that you went to today. I also stopped by my local show, but uh, we're taught. Chris C says catchers are often undervalued. It seems Dan's vintage says Orlando's episode about memories of Brooke Robinson as a tribute after he passed away is a much watch show guys. Again, a collector's dream is the channel on YouTube with our guest Orlando. Mark Santucci wants to know how my vacation was. Thank you, Mark. It was, it was a true vacation talking about true collectors. It was a true vacation. I didn't think about much else. Andrew says, a true collector has PSA slabs. I think that's got to be tongue-in-cheek. Joe Perot, welcome to the show. Uh, Mangini says, flippers absolutely hate the term true collector. And sports card dad went off on that term. Yeah. I think I can understand that. And I don't love the term either because it it excludes people. It ex Or it makes, you, it makes people think that you're excluding them. Or it makes you think that you are, you know, high and mighty if you're a true collector. I don't know that that's not what we're getting at here. Or that's not what you're about, Orlando. That's not what I'm about. But I'm curious. You know, we use the term a true collector. Let's talk about it for, for a moment here. You know, how do you define it? What, 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 what do you think is the definition? And I'm asking because I had people ask me today, what is a true collector in your... I'm going to give my thoughts. It's going to be scattered. But I want to start with, with your thoughts, if you had to sum it up. Okay. Uh, you know, again... Everybody could think about it in a different way. But uh, for me, it's somebody that my collection is not, I don't look at the value of the cards. That's not what I'm here for. I'm not buying something and selling it. I'm not a flipper. I'm not someone that's going to look for something that I'm going to buy now and sell even in five or 10 years or even 20 years from now. I'm going to look for a card that I'm going to buy and keep a forever card, you know, that's what I'm looking for. Now, of course, when I started and I was a dealer, yeah, every, you know, you, you sold and you bought to build your collection. But as a, what I'm saying is as a, a true collector, I'm, today I'm buying to keep. And my family, when I pass away, don't have to probably worry about that, but I'm, I'm getting all that ready to go for them. So it won't be an issue. So that's, I think one aspect of it, 
the other aspect, and I'm just kind of saying, you know, me, and I'm, maybe I'm an example of a true collector, but I'll share my thoughts, is a, a historian, not just of the players, but of the cards and the history of cards and the history of card production and the history of, you know, all different eras, card production and how cards were distributed and so on. You know, uh, all the way back to, you know, the, the Peck and Snyder card, you know, the, 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 the old judge cards. And when I, my, for it, one of the things I wanted to accomplish in my channel is to guide people through the different eras of cards and show them and explain to them the history, you know, how the old judge had actual photos versus the Allen and Ginter when they started the chrome lithography process. And then the Goodwin champions were the ones that, that really defined the, the, what's called chrome cards today, which is chrome lithography printing. And that was hand done during those days. And it's the same process, but it was done with limestone blocks that they would sand down and carve out the images on that. So all that stuff is, to me, a true collector knows the history of how those cards were actually manufactured, made, and the history of, of card collecting itself, how it went on from the 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 cards of different companies at, in those days, uh, Old Judge, Gypsy Queen, you know, Mameos, the Dukes, and Allen and Ginters, and it, they all got consumed into the American Tobacco Company, where it all just became the T206. And even between there, there's a the Bryce Williams cards that were literally the first kind of tobacco cards, they're 1903 cards, and those are the history and that's the, where the Hans Wagner had this Hans Wagner card in there, which is much rarer than, and the Christy Matheson rookie card in there and other, others. So, you know, I think I'm more of a historian and a collector. So I try to gather of all the different eras and examples of all the different eras, you know, of the different players. And I think more of, you know, a curator, I guess. You know, I'm not looking for something that I'm going to buy now to sell. So that's, I, I guess that's my kind of my more of a definition. And, um, you know, I just think people need to know more about, you know, cards and players and history and not just uh, what's happening now. Yeah, no, I, there are lots of, lots of great points there in my personal opinion. And, you know, just to share my thoughts on it, Orlando, I think, I think, you know, you're not you, not you, Orlando, but anybody like is, it's hard to say, oh, I'm a true collector and that's all I am, because I consider myself to be a true, a real, yeah. a genuine, an authentic collector. But I also buy and sell cards. So does that take away from the collector me? Not at all. And no one can tell me it does because I know it doesn't because we know who we are in our own shoes. So, you know, the other thing, like you said watching the values you can be a true collector and i i don't want to sound like i'm authoritative on this because i'm not i'm just going with what what i think for myself so i think that you can be a a true a real collector and still watch the value of your cards and still care about the values of your cards but you know for for myself considering myself or the true collector part of me is that when i buy a card like you i'm not planning when to sell it i'm i don't have a, an exit strategy for that card or i don't i don't have a uh, a milestone I'm looking for that is going to trigger the sale of the card. No, I want to sell. I want to sell these cards. <laughs> I've always said I'm gonna. I want to build it up for my whole life, and I want to take it down in my twilight years by traveling from show to show and just enjoying the community. But yeah, there's. Well, we've had some comments here, so before I get too far ahead, let's let's get to more of them. First of all, let's let's say hello to love what you collect. Welcome to the show. Uh, vintage Goat says, I prefer cards left the way I bought them. Don't crack it and normally don't grade it. Uh, Chris says, I think a true collector collects what he wants regardless of what others think. Not everyone wants the same thing. Yeah, I, I think that, that that's a free thinking collector. That's a confident collector. Somebody just collects what they what they enjoy. Stuke says, I cracked my cards from the packs. <laughs> I like that, Stukes, and good to see you. Hitman says, sorting is cathartic for me. Sammy Thunder Welcome to the show. Good evening to you. Bob Boozle tells me not to eat the gum. Bob, I'm going to eat the gum. I'm going to eat the gum. I got to. The battery says, I'm not a true collector. I'm a focused hoarder. I like that one. 
Uh, Mangini says, there's nothing high and mighty about being a collector. It's absurd. Absolutely. It's, it's absolutely, it's absurd. And when, when, when we see, when the greater we sees content creators or accounts or whomever looking down upon others, I don't, I'm not a fan of that either. You know, I think there's room for, and someone says here, um, yeah, right here, John Mangini says, who would people sell to if no one collected? You should respect your customers, not demonize them business one one Yeah, I completely agree with all that. Sammy Thunder, I think the whole true collector concept has gotten a bit out of hand. Yes, and with that, we'll end this discussion shortly. Uh, Orlando, with your closing thoughts on it, Vintage Goat says, everyone has their own definition of true collector, which I think is, that makes sense to me. I think everyone describes themselves when they say true collectors, fair. And Sammy says, everyone here collects something that they enjoy, whether they sell something else that they're ready to move on with doesn't disqualify their credential as a collector. So well said, Orlando. We talked about the same thing earlier. We as collectors have the right to move on from things. We have the right to get tired of things. We have the right to make room for new. We are evolving. We are growing every day. Why can't we as collectors and hobbies grow every day? Fall out of love with a card, move it, use those funds to buy something else or to, to, to buy groceries. It doesn't matter. But those are my thoughts exactly. I think we're all on the same page here. Anything you'd like to say, Orlando, before we move on? Yeah, all I have to say is that if you have to spend your time watching your collection and the value of your collection going up and down, up and down, up and down, there goes the, there goes your, your fun. There goes your relaxation and there goes your hobby. You know, it's like the stock market. You know, if I wanted a stock market, I'd go put my money in the stock market. But I want to enjoy the cars and I don't want to think about whether the value is going up or down because exactly. it doesn't matter until I sell it whenever, like, like you said, Jeremy. Yeah, Vintage Goat says, I look at the values even though I won't ever sell them. Hey, that's fair. Return to collecting says, history is more interesting than price movement. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. Dan says, I collect because the cards are art. They tell a story. They capture history. And they have some connection to my life. Guys, you guys are, I, I can't pick a favorite comment so far. These are all great. Mike Petty says, Orlando's passion for collecting is infectious. He's the only reason I'm traveling 2,300 miles to a card show to maybe spend an hour or two with him. Proud to call him a friend. You're a popular guy, Orlando. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm happy uh, and, and honored to have you on. Lauren says a personal connection to a sport, a team, a player is the groundwork for a personal collection. Right. Jeff Hart has joined us. What's going on? Fathers on Vintage. Welcome to the show. I got to tell you, Orlando, you br you're bringing so many names that I haven't seen before in the chat. So I want to thank you for being so popular. And I want to <laughs> thank you for attracting uh, a big crowd over to, to my channel and my platform, Sports Cards Live. I, I'm, I'm grateful for that, Orlando. So thank you. And I welcome everybody new and hope you enjoy the show tonight. Uh, I, I know you'll enjoy that side of the screen. We'll see if you enjoy this side or parts of it as well. All right. Let's move. Let's move along. And uh, first of all, you went to the card show today in, in your, your, your local Tell us about it. What was the what were the vibes like? How did you feel? Did you pick anything up? What did you who did you see? Tell us about it. Yeah, okay. I didn't pick much up because I'm saving some money to go to uh, Strongsville next month to meet with Mike Petty, and I know he's going to spend some bucks, so I got to have some bucks with me also. But uh, the show was very very busy, and uh, I talked to the show promoter, and they told me that uh, Friday I wasn't there Friday, but they told me that Friday was big. That Friday night it was packed. And that all dealers said that they had an awesome, awesome night. And then on Saturday, I got there early in the morning. And I went in there before the early morning people went in. I got there early. Uh, they let me in early. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the beginning, it was kind of slow. But afternoon, it all of a sudden picked up. And I saw that, uh, you know, the tables, it was about supposed to have been a 400 table show. There was more like 350 I saw some tables that were empty and I'm assuming that some of those dealers did very well and they just, sometimes they don't come to the next day, you know, but overall there was a lot of buying. I saw a lot of deals going on there and uh, the hobby is definitely not dead. Uh, it was really, from what I saw, it was busy and some of the, some tables were more crowded than others. Uh, it wasn't that much vintage, and this show was probably uh, 80, 20, 80% modern and 20% vintage. 
But I did notice a big increase in Pokemon cards and TCG cards, which I hadn't seen before. A lot of the uh, Disney, Lorcana, and Pokemon. I would say probably uh, a good 30 tables at least were just Pokemon cards. Which and is they were buying and the kids were buying. I, I wonder how the, how does the crowd feel about about this? And I'm not, I don't have an opinion either way other than like, you know, all is fair, but we go to these sports card shows, we go to sports card shops, and a lot of them are paying the rent with the Pokemon and the, the non-sports stuff. You go to a card show, do, are we at a point yet where where we want to see a separation of non-sport and sport venues maybe not shops because these guys need to survive and you know why not sell it if, if you can it's still cardboard but you know even even I, i've done a couple shows on pokemon years ago now when i started about three and a half years ago and you know my channel is called sports cards live not non-sports cards live what, what do you how do how does the chat feel about about that about going to a card show and you have to skip by so many Pokemon tables or TCG tables to get to the sports stuff? And again, I, I'm just curious if if people are getting tired of that or if it's just part of the evolution of, of the hobby. What do you think, Orlando? And by the way, Leighton Sheldon is in the back room. We're going to bring him up for the vintage spotlight segment just after this discussion. But please go ahead, Orlando. I just see a lot of kids getting into that. And, uh, and it seems to be uh, very popular. And if you look at some of the grading companies and how many Pokemon cards they're grading on a monthly basis, I mean, that's, it's, it's growing very quickly. And like I said, a lot of the kids I, I saw with the parents, they were just uh, buying packs and buying Pokemon cards that were $100, $200 cards. Yeah. Well, Vintage Goat says, I hate it. So <laughs> there's one opinion. Return to collecting. I'd love to see a split between sports and non-sports, also between vintage and modern. I think the Burbank show tried to split the game stuff from the sports stuff at their most recent couple of events. I, I believe, I'm not 100% certain on that, but I think that's what I heard. Bob Uzel says, we need a cameraman to follow Orlando and Mike Petty's spending spree. <laughs> Very good. I appeal cards. Love that name. Uh, great video today, Orlando. Hope you had fun at the show. And Dan's Vintage says there were tons of kids at the Philly show, which was absolutely great. See, isn't it always great to see a lot of lots of kids at the shows? I mean, that's when we know that, you know, like you just said, the hobby certainly isn't dead or I don't think at all. Hitman says it does not bother me at all. Stuk says we've survived Pogs, Beanie Babies. Great. It gets kids to shows. Hopefully we get some sports converts. I think that's a, those are some great points, guys. Uh, Chris, see, it's part of the evolution, but yeah, I can see it being tiresome to some. Very fair. Very fair right there. Steve Clifton, I don't mind non-sports cards at shows. Maybe brings in some kids who are getting their first exposure to sports. Yeah, Patches of Houlihan, what's going on? Says the promoter had a TCG night. I think that makes some good sense right there. Um, okay. Let's do this. We are going to bring on Leighton Sheldon from Just Collect and Vintage Breaks. He is going to join us for the Vintage Spotlight segment. Leighton, you ready to go? You good to go? He is good to go. I'd like to say welcome, Leighton, back to the show. How are you doing tonight, my guy? Oh, I'm doing great. How, how, how's it going, uh, Jeremy and Orlando? Going well. Let me great. introduce you. Leighton, this is Orlando. Orlando, Leighton, guys. Great to have you on together. Thanks for having us on, Jeremy. Yes, of course, of course. All right, well, Orlando, I wanted to, as I do every every Vintage Spotlight segment every Saturday, I always ask the guests to bring a question for Layton. Layton is a professional baseball card treasure hunter. He's got the Just Collect bricks and mortar store. He does Vintage Breaks and uh, is a great co-host with me here Saturdays for the Vintage Spotlight segment. So, Orlando, I ask you to bring a question for Leighton. Why don't you go ahead and uh, ask him the question? Yeah, I, Leighton, I follow you all the time, and uh, I'm usually in your chat when you're live there, so I don't know if you've seen me there. But anyway, my, my question is, you know, uh, there's certain, certain cards, certain players that kind of take off and I, for for an example, I'll share right before the uh, or right when the the boom started with COVID, Jackie Robinson cards took off. 
you know, and, and also Hank Aaron cards took off. And now we're seeing cards like uh, Hannes Wagner cards in the last couple of years have all of a sudden taken off. As far as vintage, because that's what I like, who, what players do you think are, is undervalued or, you know, I guess underrated or, or that you see people are not paying attention to that maybe we should be paying attention to? Well, you had me until the last part because okay. to give you to give you someone that no one is paying attention to would be very, very difficult, you know, from the vintage time period. So uh, I will happily answer, but I won't be able to do it where no one's heard of these players. That would be rather difficult. Yeah. Uh, but I'll at least give you my two cents and my humble opinion. Uh, so first off, and I guess I preface this with I don't necessarily agree, but there's absolutely something going on, Orlando, whether it be it's someone from the vintage time period, whatever you consider that time period to be, or fast forward to the current time period. If a player makes the Baseball Hall of Fame that people either were unsure was going to make the Hall of Fame for baseball, or it's a vintage player that's now made the Hall of Fame like Ted Simmons. All of a sudden, Ted Simmons, high grade 71 tops baseball rookie is hot. Does that make sense to me? Absolutely not. But learn from what's transpiring. And so if you said to me, because you asked about vintage, to me, two of the best vintage ball players, baseball uh, players, that are not in the Hall of Fame is Shoeless Joe Jackson and Pete Rose. Now, those cards are both expensive as far as Shoeless Joe's rookie or even the handful of cards he has. The Pete Rose card, you know, in VG can still be had for, you know, under a thousand bucks, but still not a cheap card. However... I believe that if Shoeless Joe Jackson, for example, who's certainly by no means uh, an unknown, he's, his cards are going to go up substantially. And the reason why I know this is because guys who pale in comparison, like Harold Baines, Lee Smith, and Ted Simmons, their cards have gone up substantially. So if I was speculating or at least building a balanced portfolio or land like a vintage – I might want to make sure because the Pete Rose rookie is definitely affordable. I wouldn't want to miss the boat on that. And Shoeless Joe is probably a little more complicated because it doesn't have that many cards. But I'm also, just to be clear, Pete Rose, I don't feel like matters whether you say you have a Pete Rose rookie or not. I absolutely own several Shoeless Joe Jackson cards, but I'm not holding them that I think he's going to make the Hall of Fame in a lifetime. I just want to be clear and transparent with everyone. And then the last part of this answer because he did play baseball, but I believe if people read more about and learn more about Jim Thorpe, he played baseball, he played football, he's one of the greatest Olympic stars ever, and he's just gotten a lore about him. Uh, and so uh, that's, my, that's my answer. Great, great answer. Thank you. Good question, Orlando. It's always, it's always fun, and it's, it is a tough question to answer because, like Leighton said, we know about most of the players. We did have a couple couple people mention some things in the in the chat. Mark Santushi calls out Carl Yastrzemski, and Chris C e calls out Frank Robinson. Uh, what do you, Orlando? What do you think of those two suggestions, Yastrzemski and Frank Robinson? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think Frank Robinson for sure. Uh, you know, first black manager. He he did a lot, and he, you know he. If you really look at his stats. Very, very impressive, uh, you know, and very undervalued. So definitely Frank Robinson. I have his rookie card, and uh, I, I love Frank Robinson, one of the, the best players. You know, he was the uh, um, MVP in both leagues. I mean, he accomplished so much. Definitely underrated Lane. and undervalued. Lane, how about you? I mean, I like Frank Robinson and Yaz, but I – Maybe it's I've been at the convention for two days in a row, so this is, you know, just the, the bluntness of what I see. I think they're both great, but do I really think that the money that's going to – it's going to go up a lot on those two guys? I don't think so. I don't see some story there that I don't know about. Um, I don't feel like their stats are – unlike any other Hall of Famer that's great from those time periods. And you might argue, as you said, MVP in both leagues, super cool. 
But is all of a sudden you're going to see a 40% gain or a 60% gain on this 57 tops rookie because of that? I don't think so. But just my, you know, my two cents. And, you know, as, you know, in terms of collecting these and thinking about values going up, I think about like, and especially just the spirit of, of the tone of this discussion and Orlando as our guest tonight, I'm thinking that, you know, we're talking about values, but to me, it's the, the, the approach here isn't to buy a card because it's going to go up in value. It's to buy a card before it goes up in value. So you can get into it cheaper. Who cares where the value goes? I mean, we, you know, both of us, we're, but I want to get in, but I want to get in now before I have to pay more for that same card. I'm still going to want it later. So I think that's a, 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 a good spin to, to take, to take on that. Um, Leighton, I don't know how much you're, how familiar you are with Orlando or you've watched much of his content, but uh, did you have any sort of questions or topics to discuss uh, tonight with, with Orlando and myself? Well, uh, I was just curious, Orlando, seeing as how you seems like you're an avid vintage collector, are you collecting sets? Do you see other people collecting vintage sets currently? Well, I, I do see a lot of people collecting vintage sets. Yes, I do. And I see a, even the young people collecting vintage sets. Uh, there's a, a, a young YouTuber, uh, Junior Fanatics 12. He's 14 years old, and he's almost completed a 1959 set. He's got a Jackie Robinson card. He's got a Satchel Page card. And I see many, many young kids getting into that. It's very difficult to build modern sets today. But I see a lot of them moving back, and uh, and yeah, set collecting is is big. I think still, of course, with the with the older collectors, thirties and forties. I think that's that's big for vintage. But I do see that a lot of people, most people that have been in it for a while. I was a set collector for many years. I got out of set collecting, sold most of my sets, and focused more on individual players, individual cards that I could enjoy more because bulk sometimes you become a hoarder when you're doing that and as we get old as i retired you got to consolidate you got to get to a point that you know what you want better cards you don't want the volume you know so that's what i did and i i went back and started you know in babe ruth and other cards like that right on good go ahead layton i was gonna say i'd like to be in that spot because I have a lot of volume and a lot of bulk, I'm laughing. Uh, but the, the thing is, Orlando, you understand this. I am, I am a collector as well. But when you buy cards, if you start telling people that come to you with a collection, they only want like 13% of what they have. And you start becoming like a baseball card snob. Let me tell you, like the professional baseball card treasure hunter, you know, moniker that I like to go with, I think professional will go by the wayside. Because people would be like, oh, you're just like every other collector. You know, you just want to get the cards you want for your collection, which there's nothing wrong with. So one of the things I guess I've, I've become uncomfortably comfortable with is buying as much as it takes to get, you know, the vintage cards. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, you know, Layton, I, I, I did that. I, I was a dealer for about uh, 15 years, at, part-time at shows. And that's how I build my collection. I bought a lot of sets that way. And I still have sets. I have a 59 set complete, a 62 set. I picked the, the best set that I like kind of for the era, and I kept that. But, yeah, I, I broke out my sets, sold everything pretty much, kept the mantles and kept some of the key cards. You know, if I had a card like, you know, I had a eight Ted Williams, I kept that. You know, so I graded the, the higher grade cards from my sets. I, I, I ended up keeping them. So uh, let's see what else I got. So cards like this, you know, an eight Bob Gibson, you know, I'm going to keep that card, but I'll sell the rest of the stuff to go and get something like, like, like that. See, I'm not sure what you're trying to do with me here on a Saturday night. I'm trying to, you know... I don't know, man, but like, call me up. I'll be happy to come over and you know, talk cards and buy cards and trade cards. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. Orlando, that's a really nice stash of cards. And uh, I really do respect what you were saying about being a part-time dealer because I feel maybe these days, I don't know, there's just so much judgment setting up at a card show. And man, I'm just really very happy to hear, you're like, listen, 
maybe I made some shekels. I did it to upgrade my collection, to enhance it. And honestly, the hobby wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for folks like you that not only did that, but that continue to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been a collector over 50 years. I'm 67 years old and I've been collecting since I was a kid. The only time I told Jeremy, the only time I stopped was about a five year period when I went to college and got married and then started all over again. And I, I used to take the kids to the card shows and, uh, you know, sometimes they would sleep under the table with, under the skirt. Of, <laughs> it was so much fun, but you know, uh, the hobby is just for me the most relaxing place in the world. You, once you you get home and you start going through your cards and enjoying your cards, you're in another world and you forget about all the politics and all the problems that are happening out there. And to me, I think that's the best thing about the hobby. You know, and yeah, you spend money, but you enjoy it. You enjoy having those cards and looking at them. And in the future, you know, yeah, you hope that it's they're worth money. And yeah, chances are they, they will. Eventually, as you know, Layton, you hold some of vintage cards of, of top name Hall of Famers, Mano and Ruth and Cobb and all that. They will hold their value and they will grow over time. And that's just been the history over as far as I've seen the price guide started. Agreed. Uh, you know, excellent point. Uh, I'm curious if you play tennis. No. All right. I, I had played, I do, did play tennis in high school, but no, I don't play tennis now. I'm asking because, you know, you you mentioned your age. I didn't ask, but you seem like you're in great shape. Uh, you know, I've been around the hobby for a while. 67 yeah. year old dealers, you know, aren't necessarily as tan as you are, you know? No. Well, I, I work out uh, as far as um, I have, you know, I used to be a runner and, and I do oh, pretty much every, every few days, I'll go out for a, a five mile walk and actually I'll do a live stream. Uh, two days ago, I think I did my last walking and talking live stream. And uh, I, I guess it was about almost two hours I walked. So, so I just felt like that keeps me in shape and I retired and you know, the reason I started really YouTube was because my dad passed away and I, I he's the only one really I shared my collection with. And um, since he passed away, I just, they, nobody really knew how, what I had because I collected by myself, you know, other than my dad. So I said, I'm going to go ahead and document my collection. And that was how I started my channel, just documenting my collection telling my basically my family this is this card and this is what it is and where it's from and what year and that's how I did my my channel and uh it just uh I don't even show my face today but that was how I started and why I wanted it because I just felt I needed to let my family know what I've got so they know if something happens to me you know like what happened to my dad but uh luckily everything's fine and I still have my mom with me and she is now 94 years old Thank God. God bless. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Layton, want to thank you as always for coming on. Anything you'd like to announce before you do, I just want to let everybody know you can follow Layton on Instagram if you're on it. Layton underscore Sheldon, just underscore collect. And his podcast, Trading Card Therapy, in the over 50 episodes now. Layton, anything else going on you'd like to uh, let people know before you sign off? Well, if you're at the Philly show, stop on by. I'll be here for a few hours in the morning tomorrow. Uh, all the details are at thephillyshow.com. The show's been packed. It's really busy. It's a lot of fun. There was even a kid's trade zone, which I just stumbled upon. eBay's there with a big booth. Um, that's great. And then lastly, Vintage Breaks has a big event ending tomorrow night at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, all you have to do to check it out is to jump on youtube.com slash vintage breaks. And amongst other cards and break credit, and really some wonderful things we're giving away. We're actually giving away a PlayStation 5, brand new. All you have to do to enter, I think, is maybe hop in the chat, say hi. Um, I'm not sure. There might be one other thing. But nonetheless, uh, if you get a chance and you're bored tomorrow, I know there's no football. Uh, come check us out. I really appreciate you having me, Jeremy. And Orlando, it was great to connect. Thank you, Layton. Right on. Thanks, Layton. Take care. We'll see you next week. Uh, speaking of Leighton at the show, I like Mookie's comment here. The best thing I discovered at Leighton's booth today was his employee who said Leighton was an outstanding boss. That's really, really nice to see. 
All right, let's go to some comments here, Orlando. There's some good stuff. Uh, I want to say hi to Manila, Philippines. Welcome to the show. Chibuller Cards, Passaby. Very interesting. Welcome to the show. Uh, this is earlier. Andrew said, I'd rather have the 64 rows than the 63 Pete Rose rookie. And the 64 rows, I was looking at two. They were both in PSA 5 holders today at my local card show. And um, it's, it's they're tempting. Great. Just like I'd rather card. have this bench than the yeah. rookie bench. For, yeah, same here. And the second, the, the Nolan Ryan from the same year as well is just a kind of a, a, a nicer card overall. Nate Adams had a great time talking with you today, Orlando, at the card show. Very nice. We had a comment on, you know, a couple more answers to your question. We had Gehrig, we had Stan Musial, we had Yogi Berra, or some other sort of, you know, under. Uh, collected, let's say, players in the hobby. Ricky Henderson was mentioned as well. Staven Sports Card says Orlando is the true collector's dream. Happy to see him on. Sammy Thunder says Orlando is the liaison of this great vintage community. Orlando, you are one popular character, my guy. Very, I, I love it. I love it. Uh, Colin Murray says supplying customers with singles is 80% of my business. Going back to the, the talk about building sets, Foul Five Ball is late to the show, but enjoyed Orlando's enjoys Orlando's collection and videos. And then Sammy Thunder says Orlando is the kindest person. You can text him and ask him questions about a card that you want more knowledge on before making the purchase. He's a big inspiration to my collecting approaches. I mean, you seem to have done this relatively quickly. You only started your YouTube channel two years ago were you were you such a i don't know just just a giver and a contributor to the community before even before you started your channel well yes i mean i've always just kind of been a, a giving person kind of this type of person that can't say no to someone you know but really what happened with me is just uh the community was just so awesome to me, Jeremy. Let me tell you what happened. When I started my YouTube channel, uh, it was four months into it, and I had 38 subscribers total, four months into it. I'm, I'm, and I put out, I mean, at least a video a week or even two videos a week and nothing. And all of a sudden, one guy, I'll give him a, a shout out, Vince, New York Yanks fan seven, saw one of my videos. And he's got a few thousand subscribers and he gave me a big shout out. And he said, I normally don't do this, but I want to shout out. And he did a video just on my channel, about my channel. And I was going to the national. I know he was going to the national. I said, I'm going to go ahead and meet him at the national and thank him very much for what he had done. And when I got to the national, I went to the, uh, the party that uh, they were having at the Clarion this is the Atlantic City National. And as soon as I got up there, uh, nobody knew me. They didn't even know my face. I went and I, I told Vince who I was and thanked him. And I told him I loved him and everything. And then all of a sudden, everybody started gathering. Mangini was the first one to offer me a drink. Come on, let's go. And he didn't even know who I was. And then all a bunch of other guys, everybody that was over there started introducing themselves and just kind of passing me around to, hey, look, this is Orlando. He's got this new channel and so on and so on and so on. And by the time I left the national, I had about 400 subscribers. And, oh. you know, I took a lot of video at the national too. That helped. But it was just a community that it really boosted me. They all gave me shout outs. They gave me shout outs on their channel. And I just got to hang out with them. And like I said before to you, uh, Jeremy, that the best thing about the hobby is the people. And that's really what's inspired and, you know, just re-energized my, my passion for this hobby. And kind of, to me, it's a all brand new hobby because I've got so many people, you know, as just friends, new friends you never had before. One of the, one of the things I put in the description for this was talking about the intangibles that the hobby brings and one of them is just what you talk about, the friendships and the relationships that we that we that we were just fortunate to to become a part of by just as a consequence of being in the hobby and, and seeking out and finding like minded people. Talk a bit more about how, you know, when you started YouTube and becoming active, how it really 
and, and I guess, did it have a key, was it a key contributor to kind of um, reinvigorating you in the hobby and the cards themselves? Yes. I mean, it really got me more focused on what am I going to do with the direction of my collection? So I had to kind of refocus and it gave me an opportunity. A lot of my cards, Jeremy, they're in the safe deposit box. You know, a lot of them were stuck in there. It gave me an opportunity to pull everything out and take a really good look at what I had and really decide, you know, is this going to be my final collection? You know, my, my, my dream collection, you know, my collector's dream, is this going to be it? And I found that there's a lot of stuff I didn't really want anymore that I collected 10 years ago. So it kind of, yeah, it reinvigorated my collecting and it kind of changed my collection slightly, not huge, but, but it took me in a more focused direction and um, I'm having more fun now and having more fun sharing what I'm doing with my collection. Cause you would, you never had the opportunity to really tell someone, Hey, you know, this is what I'm going to start doing. What do you think? You know, you always did it by yourself, but now you just share what's happening. And sometimes you get reinforcement and sometimes they say, wait, you know, don't spend your money on that yet. <laughs> how much, you know, how much has the hobby and the relationships enhanced your life? Like, and I ask you this somewhat of a loaded question because I think about just just myself and, you know, if we, as we do a mental audit of our friendship history, you know, we start off as kids in school. That's where we make our first friends. Then you go into the workforce. You make more friends there. Maybe you have kids and you become friends with the parents of your kids at the school. We make friends there. As you get older, though, it becomes harder and harder to make friends unless you're in the hobby, unless you're in the hobby. And you're I mean, you said earlier you're an introvert, but look at you. I don't know how much, you know, maybe you're not as introverted as you think you are or consider yourself to be because you're, you know, you've got tons of friends in the hobby. I'm grateful. And I think that most of my friends, most of my, my friends are, are through the hobby. I've got friends from all those other phases as well. Although the historical, you know, checkpoints in my life, but I feel like if you're in this hobby and you like people and you like talking and you want to be around like-minded people who feel the way you do and have the common interest. What a great outlet. What a, what a, it's just a, it's a, a great landscape upon which we can make friends and have relationships and enhance our life. That's what I'm getting at. There is enhancing our quality of life. I can tell you without a doubt, the hobby has done that for me. Speak about how well it's done that for you. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, the hobby itself, first of all, you know, I talked about how relaxing and enjoyable it is and you forget about the world around you. That, first of all, is, you know, I, I call it card yoga. You know, it's basically like meditating and you go into a yoga state when you're playing with your cards. But overall, the other thing that you need for, for mental health is, and they, there's a study that says that when people get older and they spend less time with other people that their mind isn't as sharp as it used to be. And one of the things they say to do is just have more friends and talk to more people because it opens your minds. It gets you thinking you're in conversation and you know, you're not staying at home bored, basically dying inside and you don't really realize it. You know, you're watching TV all day. That's what the, when you get old, that's what they do, you know? Right. So I made it a point that I, I don't do that and I'll never do that, you know? So I like to go out and do some of my nature walks or whatever, but this community, being able to really get to meet people that are the same like, that do collect like you collect, or even if they don't collect like you collect, you're talking cards, you know, you're talking stuff that is fun and it's it's just great to talk about players and you know who's better than this or who's better than that or you know it's it the community what it does is it makes you feel younger and one of the examples i talked to you about earlier and i'll tell you I, i'll tell the the people now is when i went to the, this last uh chicago national i roomed with uh ryan uh, nolan of breakout cards 24 year old guy and his partner, Steve, another 24-year-old guy. And 
something, 24, you would think they have nothing in common. You know, it's almost like you know, younger than my kids. But you know what? We talked and talked cards for hours until one, two o'clock in the morning, just talking cards. And like if we were just, you know, just two, just guys, just guys talking about cards, forget the age. And yeah. that was the most fun thing that I enjoy about this hobby is talking to people of all ages and getting their experiences and sharing their experiences. And, you know, look at the card I got, this is what I'm getting. I mean, those are the type of things you see their excitement and you talk about them and, you know, what, and it, it's great because they want to know things from me. They want to ask me, you know, because I've been in the hobby a long time. I mean, I'm not an expert. Nobody's an expert. Nobody knows everything about it, you know, but just by being in the hobby so long, you know, it's just, information sticks to you, you know? Yeah. So I appreciate everybody that, that reaches out to me and I encourage everybody to reach out to me. And through this hobby, I have met people that have written books on, on, on the hobby. Uh, I've met uh, people from the auction houses and people that actually do research and, and, and write up certain cards that are rare, that are contracted, contracted by the auction company to investigate a card that's only 10 are produced. And I've met those type of people. I've met people that have collections, Jeremy, that put my collection to shame. And the majority of the collectors are not on YouTube. You know, 90% of them are quiet. They're like me, like I was for all of my life until now, you know, until two years ago. And I've gotten to know a lot of those collectors. And that to me is the most inspiring thing. We mentioned Mike Petty, I'll give him props. An incredible collection that no one knows about. And there's many people like that. And that really has, it's great to see that. And, and I've encouraged a lot of those people to do YouTube. And that really is something that I, I, I wanna continue to encourage uh, anybody just Put, turn the camera on. I don't edit any videos. I think I'm doing pretty good. So yeah. share your collections, talk and, and, and do it, do it. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, yeah. I, I love everything you're saying. It's uh, it, the hobby has brought so many great things to so many of our lives. And, um, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, so I just got back from a 12 day vacation, Orlando. And the whole time, you know, I was, I enjoyed my vacation, but I couldn't wait to get home to whatever cards were going to come in the mail, see, you know, go to the post office, pick up the cards, come have, do this episode with you. I've been looking forward to this for, you know, all week leading up. I knew we'd have a nice conversation. I know that you'd just be a pleasure to have on, but the hobby, the cards themselves, you know, no, even no matter if you're down with, because of something in your life, you have a relationship, a, a job, one of your kids, a parent, whatever, we can always come to our cards to, you know, as you said before, just take the stresses of life away. You can, and even if the hobby itself gets you down, you know, too much noise in, in content, you can go back to your cards. The cards are still going to be there, you know, so we can always rely on them. The cards have become somewhat of like a security blanket to, I think, many of us as we get older because they, it, but it's not, it's not a security blanket for a child. It's a security blanket because they just help you balance out your thinking and, and, and balance your, your brain waves, you know, and so that you're not focusing on something that could be more destructive to your mental health or, or to just your, your mood at that time. So I love the hobby for all those things. Let's go to some comments. Orlando, Mookie Chilson said, uh, Jeremy is slowly discovering he booked an icon. I love it. Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't say I'm just discovering it, but boy, oh boy, we've got over 120 people watching right now but whoa twitter slash x wow. has got about 30 people on right now youtube 85 uh instagram's got about half a dozen so yeah we're uh you're bringing out the crowd actually i've never seen that many people at one time coming through on twitter so someone spread the news that you were on orlando and i welcome everybody watching us on x at the moment uh return to collecting says orlando was the first person i met at the national he's the best ziggy no says orlando is a pristine 10 andrew says the hobby the hobby is as good as the youtubers you watch i really believe that orlando a lot of people 
actually, and some in the chat too. That's an interesting comment because I often say, Orlando, that, you know, you can curate your collection or, or just select, you know, we can put our collections together to our own taste. We can also curate what we consume in the hobby. And it's a good way to, you know, block out things that don't enhance your life. Why? Why give your energy to things that, that have a, a negative impact? Dan says, when my channel was new, Orlando agreed to come on for an episode and he brought me so many more subscribers. That's the, the beauty of collaboration here on YouTube for sure. Legends of the Dugout says they are sub, they are they are not subs, they are friends. To which Andrew says, no, they are subs and views. But I think I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of toe the line here and say, listen, I can tell you right now, one of my early subscribers has become one of my best friends to the point where he came, drove to where I was on vacation. And spent the whole day and had a meal with my my family, with my folks, my kids, my wife, like hung out with, with the family. And I only know him because of doing YouTube. My mother loved him. She thought it was such a nice guy. It was, it was great. Uh, Ziggy No says, great show. Warm, fuzzy feeling. Mike Petty says, I never saw Jeremy enjoy himself so much and smile. Usually he has to listen to pancake guy this and burrito guy that. <laughs> pretty pretty oh. funny. Uh, I mean, hey, he's listen. a riot. Well, the one thing, and he's calling out two specific guests I've had. The one thing about me is that I, I bring on anybody, not anybody, but like people from all different areas onto the show. And no matter what their interest is or what their what their MO might be, there's still people underneath. And I enjoy getting to know all of them. Uh, whether I want to continue to know them after becomes another story, but for the most in the most uh, in most cases. I do. Uh, Mangini wants to know, Orlando, did you have a collecting idol growing up or did you kind of collect on your own? I collected on my own. Uh, the, the only people I collected with when I was young was just uh, the kids in my block. But I collected pretty much on my own. As far as an idol, yeah, Mickey Mantle was my idol growing up. You know, as, a, as a Yankee fan also, Yankees and Orioles, but mainly a Yankee, Mickey Mantle when I started collecting, it was the late uh, 60s, and that's where, you know, Mano kind of retired, but I did get the chance to, to follow him, and um, just kind of, Mano's my man. Mine was this guy right here, Dale Howard Chuck of the Winnipeg Jets. You know, I'm, I, I collect hockey mostly. I collect all sports Orlando, but hockey's like my number one, and he just passed away a couple of years ago, uh, you know, way, way too young, but he was the, he was my original you know, athlete that I, that I really enjoyed. And even though he never took us to the Stanley cup, uh, he was still our, our hero in Winnipeg uh, as, as young hockey fans, a couple more comments. Hodges says Orlando is the best. He's an inspiration in my collecting journey. And Bobby Burrell, another veteran says the cost of the card is the offset of labor. The value of the card is the pleasure of possession. The reward is priceless. Orlando knows this only too well. And Bobby Burrell has just become a poet. I would have, to say right there, Bobby, thank you so much as always for being here. Howard Chuck was great. Yes, he was, Stukes. Yes, he was. All right. So I wanted to ask you about your 52 Tops Mickey Mantle. And another little caption I put in the description was talking about authentic altered cards and kind of where they are, how they are perceived in the hobby by many, and I'm going to be curious what the what the what the chat thinks of this too. Um, so why don't you tell us the story behind your 52 tops okay. Mickey Mantle card and uh, where where your heart lies with respect to it? <laughs> okay. Well, you know, uh, my my man, the story of my Mantle card was that um, it was at an auction and it was uh, authentic altered. So. Um, it was a it was a find an attic find and PSA graded authentic altered and uh, it was just a, a perfect mantle. I've been looking for a mantle all of my life. I had every mantle card except the fifty two mantle, and um, I just uh, when I saw it, I said, "This is the one I I, I want," you know. And so I I contacted the uh, the auction house and talked to the the guy that I literally went out to the house when they found this card. It was, uh, they found it, it was an attic find that it was in a, um, the, the man, the old man had, had passed away 
family never knew they collected cards at all. And it was found in the attic in a wooden box with some of his toys. There was a stack of about 80 something uh, tops, 52 high number cards, and they were wrapped in some twine. And um, they, the, the family ended up that they knew somebody that knew about cards and they contacted that person. And that person actually was like a cousin of the, the guy from the auction house. And the auction guy went out there, looked at it, and the, the cards were, were mint. They were right out of the pack that the man had, the gentleman that passed away, the, the grandfather had opened. So he sent them all to PSA. And, you know, he told me all this story, you know, because you, I want to know when I'm going to buy a card that's going to be a lot of money, the most money I've ever spent personally on a, on a card. I want to know. And it's altered. What, how is it altered? In what way is it altered? So he told me the story that they had sent it over to uh, PSA, but he knew that it wasn't altered. Those people didn't know anything about altering or trimming. So uh, some of the cards, I think it was 20 something of the cards out of the 80, about 20 of them came back. They were altered or, or minimum size from PSA. They, they, they didn't slap them. They resend them to SGC. SGC took a look at all the cards, the cards that were minimum and were not graded. And some of them got grades and some of them remained uh, minimum size. So my... Mine basically is a, uh, it's a minimum size from, uh, SG, uh, from SGC, but it's a uh, authentic altered. And the reason that I, 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 I did this just in fun and jest, I put my label on there. Let me take this off. Hold on. Let me give you guys a good look at the 52 mantle. So, so that's really what it is. And I, I'm the, I'm the, uh, second owner of this card as it came out of the pack amazing give you a good look at it there so you can see it's literally a, a mint card the, the uh the, the guy at the auction house when he first saw it he said that it was he says this looks like a million dollar card he thought it could grade it uh you know, a, a high, uh, eight and a half, nine. Give you a good look at the corners and stuff. And it's nicely centered top to bottom. It's got a little glare there, but it's nicely centered both ways. So anyway, the guy said that uh, when he first saw it, he said, you know, that card could be like a million dollar card. And then when he got it submitted, it came out that it was a minimum size card. So... Uh, you know, here, I'll, I'll show you the little label. It's the yeah. color on that is, is spectacular. See, even, even looking at it, through the altered, but it's not, it's, it's right out of the pack, Jeremy. Yeah. It's literally right out of the pack. And it was in that box for 70 years. So it, this scared bidders away when they saw authentic altered. A lot of people didn't want to pay up on something like this so i was able to pick it up for uh, a price of a high one essentially yeah. you know and it's a and it's literally a you know as you can see the back is there's nothing wrong with it no nothing that is a million it. dollar that is a million dollar card orlando just because a grading company doesn't want to put it in their slab that is that i think you've got an absolute steal and i yeah. i respect yeah i mean First of all, that isn't altered. We know the card is not altered. Like we're, you know, we're 90% certain that card is not altered. That's yeah. what it was pulled yeah. out of the pack. Yeah. But the fact that PSA puts altered on that slab, it's kind of a double-edged sword. On the on, on the on the bad side, it takes away <laughs> some of the the shine on the card. On the good yeah. side, you got yourself an absolute steal on an amazing card. I would have never been able to get one that quality unless it was labeled authentic altered. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> so yeah. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't want it relab reholdered in the SGC cause I got to leave it in PSA cause I have the, the whole, my PSA mantle run is in a PSA registry also. So I'm not going to change it, but 
I wish it would say not altered, just authentic minimum size on the PSA holder because there is proof and we have a letter from the family. I have a letter from the family and from the, uh, the guy from the auction house that tells the story and, you know, say that, no, this card came right out of the attic like that. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Let's go to some comments about it. Uh, we got, we, so Dan says there are cards that are so old that altered is meaningless. You just need to know that it's authentic. I think that's, that, that holds true for me on some cards for sure. Justin says the blue on the mantle card is where it's at. Yeah, that color was outstanding, Orlando. Bob Boozle is a 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle collector. He just started to a true 52 Topps Mantle collector as of two minutes ago. That, welcome to the club, Bob Boozle. Chris says the minimum size is such a crock. Topps cut the cards. John Mangini agrees a lot of minimum size is nonsense as they came out of the pack that way. They didn't have perfect printing in 1952 and the 89s, all the cards I pulled, and in, in, the, in the 80s, all the cards I pulled weren't exactly the same size. I mean, that, with some brands, that actually holds true even more today. He goes on to say, but PSA controls the hobby. I think PSA doesn't control the hobby. They control the Kool-Aid that the hobby drinks. That's the way I would put it. And the hobby drinks it up. They drink it up like it's going out of style, like it's water and the well is about to dry. Mike Petty says that mantle will be a PSA 9 someday, as it should be, as it should be, I believe. Joe thinks it's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, unbelievable. 86 says, what reason did two companies say it was altered? So did you ever, did, can you answer that question? What reason was, I know PSA doesn't give a reason. Did SGC yeah. give a reason? Uh, PSA doesn't give a reason. They just put uh, altered when it's uh, short. Uh, and yeah, SGC gave a reason. They said it was uh, uh, short, uh, one sixteenth of an inch short. So it's minimum size. By, yeah. by one sixteenth of an inch, it's not ex exactly what they wanted. And remember, these were hand cut cards. You know, they cut them with the machine, yeah. but they had to put them precisely. So that this particular batch of 52 high numbers, there were, like I said, about of the 80 cards, there were about 20 that were minimum size. It just, they were cut short from tops. One sixteenth of an inch makes it from an authentic card to a PSA eight or nine card. Bob Boozle says, but who stirs the Kool-Aid? I'm going to go out on a limb and say auction houses stir the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Uh, you know, content creators stir the Kool-Aid. Jerry Petrie says, buy the card, not the grade. I mean, that's, that's you know, just kind of standard advice, standard good advice uh, going through the hobby right now for sure. Oh, Dan says that 52 Mantle is now a premium card because it was in Orlando's collection. And that's, that's a pretty neat comment. We're talking about the provenance of cards and whose they were. I once bought a card because of whose it was before Orlando. I'll, I'll quickly tell you, I bought I bought the Sports Illustrated for Kids Tiger Woods rookie card from the Dr. Newman collection. You might have heard of it out of Florida. That was sold, I believe. I believe was it Memory Lane, so that sold yes. that collection a few years ago. And I bought his old Tiger Woods SI for Kids because he was a legendary collector with a legendary collection, and I thought that was that was a pretty cool uh, provenance to have. What, how do you feel about about that kind of approach? I upgraded my 1888 Goodwin Champion set from Dr. Newman when he passed away. I bought a lot of his cards and I picked up some really nice stuff like a, uh, the highest graded uh, a Jack Dempsey from, from 1888, a seven and a half that Dr. Newman had. So I did get some of his cards. And yeah, I, I love, here's a card that, I don't know if you can see, but this card was in Roberto Clemente's personal collection. Wow. See that? It's yeah. a Roberto Clemente's collection. Roberto Clemente collection. Awesome. This card was in his personal collection, and his wife sold it. And I actually met Vera Clemente and got her autograph. Oh, that's so that. That's yeah. the kind of stuff I, I just love to have. That not a real expensive card, but it came from Clemente himself, his collections, personal collection. So that's. 
unbelievably cool. Like we, we talk about, we were just talking about, you know, the provenance of a card coming from a collector you admire or you just like as a friend sort of thing, or, you know, so, uh, you know the Dr. Newman sort of thing. Yeah. And then you have a card that came from Clemente's personal collection. I mean, yeah. you know, some people might enjoy having a, a card from Dimitri Young's collection when he had the, you know, all the Hall of Fame rookie PSA 10s, although 95% of them were likely, you know, <laughs> should have been in altered <laughs> holders, but but weren't, yeah. right? Uh, right? But that's that's a, that's a special type of provenance right there when you have a card that was owned by an athlete like Roberto Clemente, an absolute legend. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just love stuff like that. And uh, I do have cards also. I collect Cuban cards and there's um, Richard Merkin was one of the biggest uh, Cuban card collectors in, in the world, really. He had the biggest collection. And when he sold his, I have a few of the cards that say, you know, from the from his collection too. So awesome. and there's a lot of stuff like that out there. And I just love to see things that were collected by some of the OGs of the hobby like that. Right. Like having a card from Dr. Beckett's collection or, uh, you know, I mean, some some of these uh, Jefferson Burdick card. I mean, one, one yeah. could only dream to be able to own yeah. something, something uh, like that for sure. Yeah. Um, super, super interesting and, and enjoyable, like just adds another dimension to collecting. You know, it'd be nice to go to the national one year and purchase cards from specific people. That, that I haven't yet, just because I want that connection. And, and it's, it just adds to the whole thing we were talking about earlier about this hobby is a community and it's not just always about what they're worth. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's about the experiences we have. Why else do we travel to Cleveland or Atlantic city or Chicago every second year? Uh, you know, we're not just doing it to, for the cards. We're doing it for the, yeah. for the people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, yeah, that's uh, always, always really fun to, to think about that. And, and go that way for sure. I want to just dive into the authentic altered thing a bit more yes. because, you know, and I'll just sort of share with you, Orlando, my approach, which I don't think I own a single altered card in my, well, known altered or, you know, assessed as altered by a grading company at this point in time. But, and I don't, I wouldn't seek out an altered card, an authentic altered card, mm -hmm. unless it's all, unless it's like, a, there's probably, really one card that I can think of. Maybe there's, maybe there's a couple, there's a couple like a, you know, an old shoeless Joe Jackson or a 52 tops Mickey mantle. Like I would actually love to have a trimmed mantle in a, a 52 tops trimmed mantle where the slab said trimmed like authentic altered trimmed, but the card presented beautifully because for the same price, I could get a pretty beat up one where maybe it's, you know, miscut off center. It's been driven over, that kind of thing. <laughs> That's kind of cool, too. But I would enjoy a card. I, I would rather have, for the same price, a trimmed 52 tops mantle versus an, a real ugly PSA one. Now, that's just, or SGC one for that matter. That's just me. And I wonder where you fall and where people in the chat, I know some people would say, I don't want any trim cards in my collection. I'd rather have a real dirty PSA one or two or a low, low grade, but I'd rather have a presentable, uh, a card that presents better when yeah, it comes to it, that price point. Yeah. Th th I think there's two factors involved there. First, you're talking price point. If it's a card that you just can't, um, cannot afford more than a, a, a two or something like that, then you got to look at something else because you're going to get, you know, anything a one or a two, a one's going to most likely be run over by a truck you know, creases, a two is also going to have some creases or some defects there, you know, but yeah, in a case where it's a high expensive car that I just, I like to have a five because my goal is to have mid range five and up, you know, for fifties or whatever, you know, I can't afford that in a mantle. So you got to go with that. So the money, money part, you know, your budget is going to really kind of dictate and for me, I, I'd rather have eye appeal. I'd rather have that authentic altar that looks beautiful than have even a two that has creases or, you know, maybe a, some scuffs or something on that, you know. Yeah. Now, the other issue is, and I do have altered cards, but they're because of the rarity of the card. One of the cards that I have, and I don't have it with me here, it's in the safe deposit box, is the um, 
18, it's a football card, the 1894 Mayo Cut Plug Anonymous card. And it's the, it's, it's called the Hannes Wagner of football cards. There's only 10 of those cards known to exist, graded by both SGC and PSA. And this card is, it's the second, it's really the first football card ever made, a football set ever produced in 1894. And they would put in a uh, tobacco tin with, with real tobacco in it. You know what I mean? And they're big cards. And what happened with that particular card was, this was a big name player at the time, but that when the printing process, they forgot to put the player's name on the bottom of it. So the name never appeared and they stopped the printing of it. And all the other cards in the set, a lot more of them that are, were produced and they all have the name. But this one did not. And the player is Dunlop. And Dunlop was, was one of the top players at the time. He ended up being one of the, uh, a coach later on. And, and one of the early football with Walter Camp, you know. So um, this card that I am talking about has the black border, like the Mayo cards, black border. Somebody colored in the top border. It's not trimmed, it's colored in because like the 71 tops baseball with that black border, it has a similar border. So they colored it in and it came back authentic, altered. I know it's colored. There's only 10 cards that exist to that card in the world. I had an opportunity to get it. I jumped on it and I got it. I don't care if it's altered or not. And, and I know it's altered. You could tell it's altered, but that's the rarity of that. I have a few other cards like that. There's, there's less than 10 known to exist. And, you know, it, it, another one's altered. I have a Cuban card also that there's only one known there's only one on the psa pop report there's only one card period right and, and it's altered it's altered yeah. it's trimmed but it's the only one yeah. so in those cases yeah rarity where you just get it when you can get it or you can't afford to get it in a, in a in a decent grade you know so that's my that's what, what i consider consider that but when it is altered jeremy I will only buy the card if I know exactly what that alteration is. And there are some alterations I will not buy. If it's been added color or something like that, I won't buy that type of book. You know, the black border color is a different issue, but for the most part, if they tried to fill in some coloring of the, of the, of the actual card on the face or something like that, I want to know what the alteration is. I'm going to buy that card. Yeah. Not, let me make that decision, you know. I think that's prudent. That that makes a lot of sense to me. And and same here. Uh, in I think in like ninety five percent of the cases, again, I'm not out there actively looking for any altered cards or trimmed cards. And the only time I would consider buying one is if there's just nothing I could afford that I would like to look at every day. And it would. I, I again, I think we're talking about a fifty two tops mantle. That might be the only one that I would be willing to add. But so let's a couple comments here because a couple of things really actually kind of made me go, oh, wait a second after I said that earlier. So Tom Newman says authentic is worthless. Authentic is what you want. I think I think he means authentic altered is, is worthless. I guess that's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, John Mangini says, I don't like trim cards for the reason that it comes from a scammer's collection. And that's what I didn't really think of when I said that before. Mm -hmm. And that does make me kind of alter, pun intended, my thought. And really, it brings me back to, I remember a 52 tops mantle on the auction block. It was a PSA one and it had a pinhole through it. And someone else mentioned pinhole here. It had a pinhole at the top. Otherwise, this thing is probably a six and it sold for PSA one money. And this is going back to probably, I probably was watching this card likely, it was likely on eBay back in 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. And I think I tapped out at about $15,000 because I just, you know, that, that was then different times. And, you know, I regret that. Be obviously, I regret it now because that card today would probably sell for close to $100,000. So I can't afford to buy it anymore. But that's a case where, you know, again, is it altered? Not really. I mean, a kid put a pinhole in it in a very uh, innocent way, right? They didn't do it 
that, 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 that is still alteration. They're altering the state of the card, but they're doing it without any ill content. And I think that that is, a, that, that is an okay sort of yeah. alteration app. But I do, I'm, I, just like the Mangini collection says here, I don't know how good I would feel having a card that went through the trim doctor's you know, laboratory or studio, whatever. And now I'm sitting on that card. Yeah, I agree with, with, with John Mangini. That, would, yeah. uh, that wouldn't make me feel so yeah. good about the card anymore. So. It, 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 and that's why I wanted, I wanted to add to that. Uh, I have one card that I know that is trim. You know, of course, you never know. But as far as I know that it's trim, as, as far as my, the altered cards that I have, the other ones are card that, well, this was, I know, I know this one was pressed. It was in one of those big holders. It's like a perfect card, but it was put in one of these holders. So this one, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it says authentic. I won't take it off, but uh, it was pressed. And that's why it came out that way. So, yeah, I do have probably five or six authentic cards. And, um, you know, you saw two of them now. I have one that is trimmed. It's a Ty Cobb card that I know it's, it's had a little haircut on the top. And, uh, and the other one that I told you, which is the, uh, the rare one that I have, a couple of rare ones like that that are trimmed also. I mean, that some are, kids that are have... not trimmed, that, that are authentic colored and stuff but mainly trimmed right. no i have two cards that are trimmed that i know well of. you know and back in the day i mean i'm talking in the early days pre-war 30s 40s 50s 60s kids were trimming their cards to make them all the same size they were i, I just saw a, i think it was a man a 52 mantle was trimmed down to be the same size as a 50 bowman because the guy the, the kid in the day liked that the card that size to me that's a that's a fun card with a with a neat story behind it and you're going to get it for a pretty good price although you're missing a lot of the card in that case um tom newman said authentic altered is worthless he may he uh, corrected himself there bobby burrell and this is on the subjectivity of grading says we opened a pack of 54 tops hockey at the toronto expo publicly i was there i saw this happen six amazing cards a few came back as minimum size so minimum size is such like an arbitrary thing it's simply because their holders don't their holders are too big for the card so does that, but look at that, that fact penalizes the owner of those cards. Uh, here, Mookie Chilson says, give me a presentable pinhole 52 mantle. Yes, 100%. I'm with you on that, Mookie. Totally. Justin Boat says, nothing wrong with rounded corner old cards. And this is where, mm -hmm. this is, that's my sweet spot, Orlando. I love, you know, those 48, 49 Bowman Leaf cards with, nice uniformly uniform rounding on the corners i love that i don't want i really don't want my vintage cards to have perfectly squared corners because i get suspicious a lot of the time yeah. especially if they're in you know some psa holders and it's like uh, you know i don't know it makes you sometimes i think 70 percent of those cards are and that number i say could change day to day but you know our our trim that's the one thing we we talk about not wanting trim cards in our collections but all of us all of us that have you know, any amount of volume of cards that are graded and vintage, I got to think if you didn't grade them all yourself, a lot of us probably have a few trimmed cards that are not as not identified as such in our collections. Does that, do you think I'm right about that? Or do you think I might be uh, a little paranoid with that comment? Most of my cards uh, that I have, I've had for my collection. When I bought back in the old days, they were all raw. So the majority of my cards were, I graded them myself. And I did get some minimum size back. I mean, I just got a YD4, 65 YD4, came back minimum size. And I mean, you know, these, some of these cards that you've had, you know, 30, 20, 30 years, even before all, any trimming scandal, and they still come back that way. It's just, uh, it happens, uh, you know, and PSA is a little more strict as far as the size for a vintage SGC is a little more uh, liberal, slightly. They, their tolerance is a little bit more for, uh, for trim cards. Not trim, I'm sorry, not, not trim. For uh, cards that are cut short from the factory. You know, because they know that different mm -hmm. years, you know, they're different. And, you know, as a set builder, when, I would put, when you put your set together in the old days, you didn't have the sleeves. So you put the set in the box, and I'll show you some boxes of cards from the 70s 
you put them in, you look at them in the box and you have cards that are bigger and smaller than, yeah, yeah. they're not all exactly the same. Nope. And, and, and that happens all the time. The difference is, can you tell whether it's trimmed or that's cut from the factory? Now, as a longtime dealer, and I'll also say, in, I don't know if you know, but I did go to the um, grading school. I went to, uh, to with Andy Broom over to uh, uh, CSG CSC. or CGC, whatever they call it now in Sarasota. Yep. And uh, when they needed uh, some graders, I uh, they, they sent out notice and I sent back my information. They called me in. I went in there. I did a two-day instructional class there that they did. And I met with Andy Broom. I was able to talk to him a little while. Kind of got to see how they tell it. And one of the things that they focused on was altered cards. At the end of the session, the end of the second day, they gave you a test. And the test they tell you, you have 10 cards, you got half hour to grade them with grading notes and you grade them different, uh, you know, centering all that stuff, right? And they tell you one of the cards that you're getting in that 10 cards is altered. You don't know if it's trimmed, colored, whatever it is, you don't know. So you have to try to determine it. And of course they show you how to do it. And there's different ways to look at it. You know, you have to look through the loop. You have to look at all of the, all of the, not just the corners, but the side of the card where it's been cut. Because if it's trimmed, you could see that it'll be a little darker. The, the, the white part, you'll see white. You know, you, could, you have to look in the loop, but there's ways that you can tell when that card has been trimmed all of the the side of the card all of the, the side of the card like that all looks the same either they trimmed all four corners or they didn't trim it at all you know so there are ways and of course they have the the black light you use the black light to see if there's any coloring been added and alterations been added but uh you know those are the things that you know if, if you're if you're going to buy raw cards like i do because i buy raw cards and this eight and a half that you saw Bought that raw and I got that graded uh, this past uh, year, a few months ago. Yeah. You know, but I looked it over and all that stuff. Yeah, you do what you have to do. And, and when, you, when you're going to buy cards like that, in the old days, Jeremy, you know, there was no grading because before PSA, you had to, when you were dealing with cards, you had to first of all determine the grade. You and the and the buyer had to determine the grade before you got to the price. So you had to really become your own grader, and and that's what I learned. And I think people need to do that more often nowadays. They just look at slabs and, and that's it, you know. So that's I was it. privileged. You you have to look at the card and and instead of believing the grade, you have to decide. Do you agree that it was graded correctly? by that grader on that day. Do you agree with that grade? Because let's face it, a lot of us probably think we're pretty good at grading cards. And I would think that, and, and by that, I just mean, have, we have a feel for, you look at so many cards, you, you can, you can, oh, that's going to be a four, that's a five. And, you know, we'll be right half the time and the other half will be off by a grade, maybe a couple times off by a couple grades if you're seeing everything. But yeah, you have to, you have to look at the card and say, do I agree with the grade? And if you don't agree with it because you think the card is lower, is in worse condition than the slab tells you, well, that's a card to avoid because you're going to have to overpay. But if you can look at a card and think that it's undergraded and you can buy it for, you know, the, the average price of cards in that grade, well, now you can get yourself a pretty good deal, most likely. So, yeah, uh, we, have to, we have to use our own brains, as someone just said in the comments. Let's go to some more comments though here. Dan's Vengeance says trimmed is an opinion. Don't tell anybody, but I received I resubbed two trimmed cards that received numerical grades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, Dan, that does not surprise me that that happened. Uh, Vintage Goats, if I were to have an altered card, I would like it to have either pinholes or initials. I like knowing that a kid enjoyed it 50 years ago. I love that as well. I've got, where did I put them up there? I've got some old uh, old albums for cards from the 50s, and they have initials on them. And I think that's the best part of the, the story. The professor says, does Orlando have an opinion on doing card restoration for creases that some card doctors are able to do, or is restoring a card altering a card? 
Um, you know, I think I want to come back to that one in a, in a few minutes. So we'll put that one on the back burner for now. Vintage Goats says pinholes and initials are my favorites. I love those too. Triple V, great to see Orlando in here. Mangini says a pinhole should be a 1.5 or a 1, not altered. I th why, why do they have to be a 1.5 or a 1? Why can't it be a 3 or a 4? If the card is otherwise a 6, but it has a pinhole, it doesn't kill the condition of the card to me. I think it's over. I think they overly penalize for a simple pinhole. Now, if it's a staple, you got two holes at the top. Maybe it's got to come down another grade. But to automatically call it a one or a one point five, it's just it's 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 not fair to the card. I don't think personally. Uh, Mangini says the tiny pinhole is no issue for me, especially since PSA controls the hobby and the Kool Aid. You can get them super cheap. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Joe Pro says, I purchased vintage authentic altered cards in both BVG and PSA slabs. I feel like if the altered card status is explicit, it's not a cardinal sin. And sometimes the eye appeal is aesthetically yeah. pleasing. And that's, you know, for somebody who is okay knowing that somebody took a blade to the card or an exacto knife or whatever. So again, each to their own. Jeff's card journey, so many cards from PSA now are coming back min size. PSA doesn't want to be what doesn't want to take the risk of slabbing the card now and then paying for it later? Ridiculous. Yeah, I hear that, Jeff's card journey. But I also wonder, like, wh what is their option? Because it's really hard. It's really hard if they, if there is any risk that the card was was trimmed and it's and it's smaller. I think they just have to cover their 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 backsides and say we're just gonna we're just gonna. It's like it's like a lawyer fires his client. Like no one's, you're not obligated to serve everybody who comes to your door. You know, you you can take some control, and I think that's what PSA has done is just taking some control over what liability they might have when some cards in their slabs, and it's for their reputation as well, which you know is object. You know, people recognize that it that grading is somewhat of a of a random sort of thing in many cases, and. I don't blame PSA for not wanting and um, for not doing it because I don't know that they know that they're not trimmed, but I'm not sure. Uh, continuing on, just three more here. Bob Boozle says some bozos cut their cards, other morons drown them. Uh, deep value investor, the, he's the burrito guy, says, did I hear burrito? Uh, welcome to the show as always. And Andrew says Orlando is making a lot of sense for a hobby that doesn't make sense. Okay. Let's go back to the professor's comment here, Orlando, uh, in terms of we just talked about drowning cards, you know, cleaning them. I'll tell you one thing, Orlando, I will not buy a vintage card that has borders that look like it was just packed pulled because I know it's been whatever, bleached or soaked or whatever. I, I like my vintage to look vintage. I don't want my vintage to look like it just came out of the pack unless unless it's like your 52 tops mantle where it's just super clean but you know i again i want some age i want my card to show its age a little bit what about you no card restoration at all for me nothing i i just want the card as is you know why do you need to mess with the card why do you need to touch the card you know, I, I just don't believe in and not even cleaning the card. I don't believe in any of that. I just want the card as it was in its natural state. If it's got some a little dirt stuck on there, I'm that's fine. You know, and if you don't want it, don't buy that card. Get another one. But as far as cleaning, I will never buy a card that I know has been, uh, you know, soaked and stuff like that, and, and with chemicals because usually that's what they do. And I have, I've run into that issue, you know, as a, uh, a specific collector of a certain set. Sometimes there's cards that there's only 20 known to exist. And I've bought some cards and I won't mention who it's from, but that, yes, they were, they were literally soaked with chemical and the stain in the back, they were glued onto a, to an album. The stain in the back came back after a certain amount of years. I did a video mm -hmm. on it. I'm seeing if I can find the card. I have it here, actually. I have it here somewhere. But uh, the actual stain on that card, when I first got it, it looked like it wasn't there. It was all white in the back. Too white. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But at the end, here it is. Here we go. Let me check it out. Okay. 
This card here has been soaked out of an album. It was beautiful, white, beautiful, but the stain on the back, it was not there when I first got it. I've had this card for years now, and the stain has, the, you, oh. see the, the, you see the glue stain right there? Yeah. You see how that's come back? Now, this is this is the same card. Okay, this is the highest graded example of this card, near mint eight. It's from 1888. Okay, and this is the example that was soaked. It's so hard to see it. It but, is. It, it... But but the back of this one of the eight is just you can see the back how it is. It's not as white, but it's there's no staining. It's all even. This one is a lot wider. You see it together, the, yep. the back, how white this is? That's been soaked with some type of chemical. It removed it and made it nice and white, you know? And then after, after years of being in this holder, whether it didn't get enough air or whatever, the back glue started coming back. This card... Mm -hmm. I'm taking it to the national. I'm going to show it to PSA and tell them this is now. It's a six. This should be a two with, mm. the, with the back stay. See what they tell me on that one. And I'm going to take the highest graded card they have of the same guy. And I'm going to show them the difference. I've got the, the PSA eight that they graded. And I'm going to compare them and see the difference. And you could, you could see oh, yeah. in the back and the front the difference in colors. So I'm yeah. going to show PSA how to do their job. And a card from how that card is, you know, too too white. I'm with you, man. If it's too white, I just, I don't feel good about it. It's similar to what uh, Mangina was saying earlier about, you know, having a trimmed card from a trimmer. Where did it come from? You know, it doesn't... It, a card that is that looks too clean to me and that did go through that process i just i just don't i i'm not i'm not interested i love i love cards that grade out in that you know vg kind of range that that threes to fives that again look their age have some toning on the white borders slight rounding on all four corners. I want that, and I want that rounding to be uniform. I don't want it to, you know, just the top corners to be round and the bottom ones to be square. I want them all to be, to have the same amount of rounding. That to me is a just a, a lovely card to have and so much more interesting than a card that's been worked on by, mm -hmm. by anybody. So now, yeah. you know, we have some comments about Kurt's card care coming through here. People saying, oh, Kurt's card care can, can fix that card for you. But is it a permanent fix? Because it looks like sometimes these things can come back. And I don't know. I don't know, Kurt. I've never, I don't think I've ever uh, talked to him, but I don't know what his position or if, if he's someone who, you know, would have taken that out of the first place, uh, what sort of guarantee he offers that it will never come back. And and then even still, if you know that it's sort of dormant in that card, I don't, I still don't want it. So yeah, it's, uh, that's where I'm at on it. Same, same as you, pretty much. Yeah, I won't buy it. All right. Um, well, listen. Let's let's talk about another. So, when collectors, the parent company to PSA, purchased P, purchased SGC about two weeks ago or so now, just under two weeks ago, I had just gotten. I believe I maybe it was that day. I just left for vacation, and I haven't done any. You know, everyone's done content on it. I haven't done anything about it. And um, I'm not really planning to, except for having a little chat here if it comes up on one of my future shows. But um, I wanted to just, you know, address it briefly and, um, you know, ask you your position on it. Does the fact, and I did have a conversation at my local show today, I did have a conversation with somebody who actually was pretty cool. Someone recognized me and came and said hello, said that he watches some of what I do and um, on, on YouTube, that is. And uh, anyway... We chatted about, about it a little bit, and that was the first time I'd really talked to anybody about it, uh, you know, that isn't, you know, someone that I talk to every day, let's say, in any event. 
What are your thoughts? Does the fact that the same company that owns PSA now owns SGC, does that change the hobby for you, Orlando, at all? Does it change how you hobby? It's not going to change how I hobby. Uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, you know, five years from now. But I think that uh, as far as SGC uh, and, and vintage, which is my expertise, you know, they have been grading vintage for, what, 30 years now. And, you know, they're known to be very good, solid uh, graders. Uh, actually, a little, probably maybe a little bit better in, in some vintage than uh, PSA. So I, I think that the value as far as, you know, va talking value, I think, you know, they're going to be stable as far as the vintage that's been graded. In the future, I don't know. You know, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. My opinion on the... Uh, on the acquisition is that I think PSA is going to learn a lot from owning SGC. Uh, you know, they're going to probably m maybe use their graders or have their graders teach PSA's graders how to grade certain cards or certain vintage cards that PSA may not be experts in. So I think that's going to help out. Remember, PSA has hired so many, many new graders over this COVID period doing you know over a million cards a month you know so i think they need some veterans uh, or, or some more guidance in that and uh, i think they're going to grab some of that information from sgc on on what are some of their standards how are their standards compared to our standards and let's see if we can improve i think psa also has to improve on their customer service it's just horrible uh, and they're getting a little better from what I see in their turnaround times, but you know, that's where SGC and the customer service turnaround times. I mean, it, it, those are the kind of things that, that PSA, I think is going to learn from SGC. I think that's going to help them grow. You know, SGC was never going to overtake PSA. PSA is, you know, the, the elephant, the monster, you know, they're, they're never even getting close. They, they don't even do what maybe 10%. Of what PSA does. So, you know, I think they're going to keep it separate. In my opinion, they should keep it separate for a while, study each other. Remember, now PSA is going to have the SEC's customer list and everything, you know. So um, I think PSA is just going to see what happens, uh, let them do their, their own thing, and keep an eye on, on SGC and say, let's see how they're going to function. They've been successful and they've been growing faster than. PSA has been lately, at least in the vintage area. So I think uh, that's kind of what I, my opinion on that. Yeah, no, really, really insightful comments for me to hear. I don't really have much to say about it. Doesn't it doesn't change my hobby at all? Doesn't it's like it's big news for the greater hobby. I understand that, but for me, it doesn't change anything uh, with respect to either of the companies. I don't. I've. Just, I'm not. You know. We, you see, you see acquisitions happen in, in across industries all the time, and very often it's for synergies and to you know eliminate redundancies, similar to synergies. Saying it a different way, I guess. And so I, th I think they'll find ways to streamline things. Uh, will they keep both brands? I don't know. I, maybe, maybe, but for how long? I, I don't know. I think you know I. They acquired some some grading skill, some grading expertise. That's great. Peter Steinberg, who has been instrumental in SGC's growth, is, I mean, he's he's an impressive young young guy. Peter Steinberg is, and I got to think that even having him as part of the team, usually, the the founder goes within you know by the end of the year, the founder's gone uh, after being after their company being acquired. I'm, I know he's not the founder, but he's the president or what or CEO or whatever his title is. In this case, I think they might want to keep him because he's he's young and he's uh he's very professional and uh, seems to have a good head on his shoulder. So we'll see what happens. But for me, again, Orlando doesn't change a thing. I I didn't care as much as everybody else did that I see talking about it all the time. And but that's just because just doesn't doesn't really impact my collecting much. You know, I'm going to continue to assess the cards myself, and if they are in a, sla a holder that I don't like the aesthetics of, I can change that, you know, or I'll just wait for a copy that's in a holder that I do like uh, if I have to. So I don't really have much to say about it other other than um, 
don't it's not i don't think it's worthy of bringing you down in the hobby you know or like, like okay a couple more comments here we got we got we're boy you guys have been on fire tonight uh mark santucci says jeremy what about a 1976 johnny bench do you want a five or a seven in that case mark i would prefer a seven vintage says orlando are you okay with soaking just to get the card glued down out of the album can you remove them without chemicals asking because i don't know do you want to just briefly okay. respond to that orlando yeah uh yes for for soaking in strictly in distilled water to get something out of an album i'm i'm okay with that uh there are a lot of um sets for example in cuba and venezuela a lot of those cards were made to be stuck on albums so whether you know it or not a lot of those have been removed from albums right? and yeah. and yes if they're removed with just distilled water and soaked and dried it's not really gonna alter them or harm them now if you put some chemicals some hydrogen peroxide stuff like that to whiten the card or to alterations i'm not down with that so strictly just in certain cases yes but a lot of the cards that are removed from those albums especially the cuban cards end up grading one or two no higher than that so you know keep that in mind but but generally no i i don't like to do that but sometimes yeah I, i'm okay with that in certain cases yeah well, i think sometimes it's practical right to get it out of the album that's a sort of a and then it, it it's it's bringing it's yeah I, I get it's it's tough to say is it restoration is it alteration or is it rejuvenation you're kind of bring, giving the card a second life and there's I think there's something to be said about that uh, Skeppy says there is a there is like sorry there is likely cards in your collection right now that have been restored so you're okay that as long as the you're okay with that as long as the label says it isn't and that's a question I think that's a question directed at me. I don't know. I don't know, Skeppy, where you got that information, how you how you got that out of anything that I said. But if that is directed to me, I'll just say that um, I likely do have a card or two in my collection that's been restored. Just you know, it's a it's a numbers game at that point. Um, and no, I'm not okay with it because I don't know about it. You know, if I don't know about it, I don't know about it. I once did have a card that I suspected was altered, or or yeah, it was altered by bleach or making it nicer i sold it i didn't want it anymore i don't know i can't tell you you know i can't tell you if it was or wasn't but just the, it just didn't sit right with me so no i don't want i don't want any card like that foul fireball says i don't collect plastic only cardboard that's a that's a nice approach jeremy uh cooter lev says friends don't let friends encapsulate vintage cards in psa slab well, <laughs> well then no, then we none of us have friends because uh, no cooter. They they've got most of the market. That's for sure. Mike Petty says they will stut they will shut down that company in twelve months and steal money from the collectors and crossover fees. It's all part of the grand design, in my humble opinion. Um, maybe maybe hopefully there's uh, hopefully there are some positive reasons for the acquisition. The hobby with Cage says customer service and turnaround times are easy for SGC. They have less than one tenth of PSA's volume, but that's not a cage. I don't think that's, I don't think you're doing any favor to PSA with that comment because all that tells me is that PSA hasn't scaled and they've let their customers. Now I haven't submitted to PSA uh, in a while. So I don't, I haven't dealt with their customers. I can't speak with the first hand, but when you grow, you got to grow everywhere, you know, otherwise, you know, you're just, you know, as we grow, you, you're gonna get, you're gonna, you're gonna get new shoes to keep up with your growth, just like you're gonna get new pants to keep up with your growth. You, you know, you're not just gonna get new pants and, and and not wear new shoes. You need to grow all your departments, all your areas, or else you're doing a disservice to your to to your customers, to the community, to the industry, especially when you have so much of the market share. So while it might be, he says they had less, or customer service turnaround times are easy for SGC. I think it comes down to priority uh, as well too. I'm not I'm not willing to give PSA a pass for those reasons. There, K Card says anyone getting a big check will leave uh, in in the world of M and A, and that's been what I've seen. I've experienced it firsthand, and that's uh, you know I've seen that myself as well. 
Uh, okay. Wow. Lots of, uh, we're, we're coming out. Oh, wow. We're two seconds away from the two hour mark, Orlando. Wow. Already. Yeah. Already. It doesn't take long when you're having a, uh, when you're having a fun conversation, let's just do a few more comments here and, um, and maybe we'll wrap up, but I'll go through a few more, uh, right now and get your thoughts on some of these Orlando, if that's okay. Andrew says altered cards and trim cards used to be malpractice. Now it's accepted, not by me, but others don't seem to care. Depends on the, I think people, I think that's a sliding scale too. Don't you like mm. there are different people have different tolerances to different, uh, different circumstances or around a card. So I, I think that makes sense to me. Justin says, I love how Jeremy's up front and real. Thank you, Justin. I, I try to be that way uh, for sure. Decoy says, I think we need to start a downgrade campaign for modern cards with the slogan, Run, rub some dirt on it. See, that's, he's saying this tongue in cheek, with the, but it's not that far fetched, Orlando. Yeah. I'm, I'm part of a vintage group chat, and a comment often made is look, I've upgraded by downgrading because let's face it, Orlando. There are PSA threes that are a lot nicer than fives and sixes out there. And you can go all, all over the grading scale and make comments like that. And there's, there's nothing, it's a really good feeling to, you know, sell your PSA seven for $5,000. I'm just running pretend number, sell your PSA seven for 5,000, buy a PSA four for a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars that you like more. And you have all that money left to buy more cards. Have you ever done something like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I do that all the time. <laughs> Sometimes you have to, you know, because you know, I have a, a Mini Minoso that's a five. It looks like a seven, you know. So, yeah, sometimes you just have to move a card and, uh, you know, eventually pick up another one. I sold my Jackies, all my Jackie Robinson cards, you know, and they, they were pretty nice. But I figured now I can get one a lot cheaper, and less grade. Because mine was way off, mine were pretty much all off centered. Because in the old days, you didn't look at centering as much as corners, you know. So now, reevaluating some of the cards, and I sold some of the ones that I didn't. But yeah, for sure, you know, sell some of those sevens or eights, and get yourself a beautiful five, and you're good to go. That's you know, the, you know, one of the oldest sort of uh, sayings out there is you know buy the best you can afford right and it goes for lots of different things in, in the collectible art world that sort of thing but i don't know that that makes a ton of sense right now when the best is defined by what a grading company says is the best and it's just it just doesn't all reconcile in in my mind anymore once you start to think for yourself you realize that you are literally at the mercy of and, and we know how hard it is for them to hire people in the grading in the in the grading department because they can't pay them enough, and it's a tedious job. It gets very tiring, you know. Eight hours into a shift on on Thursday or Friday, you know, in, into the week, how accurate are they? How 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 awake are these guys that are grading the cards? You really, as collectors, we really need to. It's more important that we agree with the grade than what the grade is in the first place, you know. And if you can find a card that presents really well with nice eye appeal, that is, you know, technically uh, has a lower grade because of maybe a, a hardly visible hairline crease, uh, you know, three millimeters long on the back of the card, like, come on, what a what an opportunity to get a great card, you know, in that condition, in that state. So I'm all for upgrading by downgrading. I think that's a, a great way to be. Remember that the uh, graders only get two to three minutes to look at that card. Even, even two to three. <laughs> if, if, yeah, if that. I think you're being extremely generous. I, I don't know. I'm guessing it's like well, 30 generous. to 45 it's, seconds. It, it, no, sometimes, yeah, you got to get it done in a minute or two because you got to take notes too. They got, you know, they all have greater notes. They won't share it with you, but they do. But they won't, they won't tell you why your card got the grade it did, but they yeah. will. But they, but but they'll give you the grade. Uh, Andrew says Orlando is a comment generator. He sure is. I'm, <laughs> I'm having trouble keeping up with everything here today, but uh, still a lot of a lot of fun. Uh, deep value. Brent Wire, the burrito guy, Mister who who really brought the Pareto principle to the hobby's conscience, says, "Do we think the market has gone too far with centering as being the main focus? It used to be corners, like you said. 
And I agree, Orlando is right. I mean, I had a card shop in the early 90s, Orlando, and it was all about corner centering. It was not really, it was corners and edges back then. It wasn't so much about centering. Uh, to me, and I've said a million times on, on my channel here, Orlando, registration is most important to me. It comes above everything else, especially on vintage, where it's mostly an issue. I want my card to, I want, I don't want 3D car. I don't want to put on 3D glasses. What, what do you think about Deep Value's comment here? And where do you fall on centering? You know, I agree with him. I think uh, it all comes down to eye appeal. Centering is a big part of eye appeal, but definitely the uh, the, uh, the the color registration to me are the, the main things. I want that card to be very well registered and I want those colors to pop. I don't want a card that's still faded, you know. The corners aren't as important anymore to me. And, uh, you know, definitely, I think centering is important because it adds to the eye appeal. Uh, so it's become more popular because vintage cards are much tougher to find. People are realizing it's tough to find a centered uh, vintage card. Yeah, yeah. It, it is tough to find. That's your, that's your sort of organic scarcity as far as uh, centeredness goes. It is tougher to find, and, it, and they do look really nice but a, a perfectly centered cards with 90 degree square corners nice untouched edges but that is you know completely out of focus and blurry you know you see it a lot with the jackie rookies and you know the cards from those from that era i i would much rather have a low grade well focused card with good color and rounded yeah. corners like that's a tough tough set to get centered and uh, you know, registration, mm -hmm. the, the 40 and 49 leaf. Yeah. Beautiful cards. Beautiful yeah. cards. Yankees fan told his wife today he was an eight. She said, no, you're an off centered six. Oh, <laughs> love it. Good. At least she knew how to respond to that, to that comment. Uh, the professor says, should Chrome cards that become green be considered altered? I don't think so. Cause nothing, no one touched the card for that to happen. That's just a, chemical reaction that happens over the years is my understanding. Mark Santucci bought an off-center card today, but no creases. Very good. Very good. Mike Petty says, I'm all, I'm all about Reggie registration. Andrew, vintage cards are supposed to look old. It would be like telling your grandma to get Botox. <laughs> Many of them do though, that do get, so it's like, that, that's a funny sort that's a funny uh, comparison there. The, the grandmother's getting Botox or the cards getting uh, you know, rest, rest, restoration, I guess. Yeah. Cleaning. <laughs> Cleaning, right? Yeah. What's wrong with a grandma with Botox as K cards? Yeah. All right. We're going, now we're going off the rails here for sure. All right, Orlando. Well, listen, man, this has been a lot of fun. Great, great topics. Uh, you're, you're a pleasure to have on and to chat with uh, very, I can see why you're so popular. You're just so laid back and you, you, you clearly love the hobby. You're, I want to, I was about to say you're in it for all the right reasons, but even flippers are in it. No, is that a wrong reason to be in the hobby? Some would say so, but uh, I couldn't, I can't think of any wrong reason you're in the hobby. And, um, and I do love how, you know, we even, we have our, our chronology in the hobby is very similar, Orlando. We started around the same age and we've been in our whole lives, but we both slowed down for that five year period in, in the college years. And um, so I feel like we have a lot in common that makes me, you know, feel even further rapport with you. Andrew says, Orlando, great job. Cooter Lev, I, Cooter Lev, that's a funny comment right there. Deep Value thinks you have a nice soul, Orlando. Very nice. Brent Dan says, a fantastic show, Jeremy. Thanks for showing such regard to hobby hero Orlando. Brent says, no wrong reason to be in this hobby. And I try to be open-minded for unless you are committing fraud or you're being you're being deceptive, you're trying to rip people off, I'm okay with you being in the hobby. Thank you, Justin Bode. Appreciate that. Orlando, listen, I want to just again say thanks for coming on. Thanks for your time today. Short notice as well on meeting with me, considering I was out of pocket here for the last 12 days. And I want to also thank you for just bringing so many new people to, to my channel. Um, I was, I, I, Honestly, I wasn't expecting that. I didn't. I didn't know that yeah, that uh, that that would happen. But yeah, I posted it. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. And when that happens, it's um, it's just 
it, it just it just opens my eyes to how big the community is and how fragmented it really is too, which I'm not saying is a bad thing. You know, it's just the way it is. So uh, I'm always so grateful when a, a great guest brings more people to the show and that just, you know, maybe one or two of them convert and join me in my chat here when I do my lives on Saturday nights. And that's just more engagement in the hobby. It, it's it's more uh, enhancement to my my experience, to my life. So I want to thank you for that, Orlando. Thank you. Yeah, that's what the hobby is all about. Just everybody helping each other. And even though we all have smaller little niches, we're all one big community. And uh, these are the type of things that I like to do, interview with all different types of people to get everybody together. You know, we need to yeah. do more of that. So thank you very much, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank you again, Orlando. Okay, guys, I'm going to read the final comments and then we're going to wrap this one up. Grotman Card says, awesome show. Nice seeing a fellow South Florida guy be such a great representation of the hobby. That's Mitch Grotman. Thank you, Mitch. Mark Santucci gives us a five out of five. The chat blew up. It did. I had trouble keeping up tonight, guys. Return to Collecting says, thanks for having Orlando on. He's the best. Stukes, as always, thank you so much for being here. Mike Petty says, I finally turned the corner after three years skating downhill with a glass of lemonade in one hand from here. I'll take that as a compliment, Mike Petty. You can be tough to please, but if I can do it, I'll be proud of when it happens. Bobby Burrell says, please hit the love button. The show was that good. Thank you, Bobby Burrell. As always, thank you, Justin, says Orlando, you are great. 1956 Top Sky feels like YouTube and IG communities are different worlds. It's so true, Matthew. They are different worlds. And and one world, one, one each of those worlds, neither of those worlds represents the whole hobby, right? If we can get together, yeah, like there's, it's just a cross section. It, it's a cross section, but not, I wouldn't say even say it's a complete cross section, either of them, but they're there. Mookie Chilson, thank you so much. Mike Petty, amazing how every guest isn't a scammer or ex-scammer. Thanks, Orlando. You're the best. <laughs> Mike Petty, I've had over 300 people on the show, Mike. Um, you got, you got, you got to do your full research to see that. Andrew, thank you so much. Irish Flyers, appreciate that. Jeff McMahon, good night to you. And Mike Petty, thanks you, Orlando. All right, man. Again, thank you for joining, everybody. Have a great night, Saturday night. I'll be back tomorrow with my friend Josh Madigan of the Hockey Cards Gong Show, where we will be covering the PWCC. Hockey Weekly Auction, where we do educate and take Q&A. It is a lot of fun. Foul Fieball says, do more of these kinds of shows. Hey, I do them. I do them. They're just not, they're not every week, but I do do them for sure. Next week will be very similar, I think. We have another great collector coming on net, next week. Orlando, I'm going to give you a chance to give your final words and message to the audience, and then this episode will be over. Just want to thank everybody for showing up and staying in the chat for two hours. That's incredible. And thanks for all your support. I appreciate it all. Thank you, Jeremy, very, very much. Enjoy the hobby, guys. Make some new friends. Ah, wait, that's a great exit right there. All right, guys. Orlando, great having you on. Everybody else, thanks again. This episode of Sports Cards Live is now over.